Hey there, Vana friends. This is Alex, and I've got a quick note before we get started with this week's episode of Kurt Vana Guys. Also, we're so glad you're listening. Uh, this is a full regular episode about our next Vonnegut book, which is Palm Sunday, and we tape this episode live at the Last Bookstore, which is a bookstore in downtown LA that is one of my favorite locations on earth. The crowd was wonderful. The space was wonderful. Also, we didn't really mic the crowd for the Q&A session at the end of the episode, so please be aware that there's some little edits and stuff and whip sounds and things to make that Q&A just sound smoother. More importantly, be aware that Michael and I had an absolute blast doing this show. We had such a blast. I think I'm a little mumbly in places. Uh, I apologize. I was just that excited about the whole thing. Quick programming note. Our next episode after this one will be in studio, and it's about the 1982 Kurt Vonnegut novel, Dead Eye Dick. So read along if you like. Also, as many people told us at the show, and have told us before online, you don't need to read along to enjoy this podcast. It's fun either way. Always like to emphasize that whenever we can. And I had tons of fun on this Palm Sunday podcast episode. I think Michael did too, and we hope you will as well. So without further ado, here's the first ever live episode of Kurt Vonnegut's. Hey everyone! Oh, these mics are great, Brett. Don't talk shit on the venue's yeah. mics. Oh, my voice is lustrous. Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut, guys, the podcast about the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut, because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swain. Hi, Alex. Thank you for yeah. having me. Such a pleasure to be here at the wow. last bookstore, where I've never been such a fabulous venue. It's incredible. Yeah. It's amazing how you can tell from the shape of the building that it used to be a Circuit City. I love that. <laughs> We are, if you're listening at home and you're not one of these lucky people here joining us, this is a live episode and we're so thrilled to have all of you in the house. And we're talking today about a book called Palm Sunday, which is a 1981 Kurt Vonnegut book about uh, his whole life and everything he's ever written and everything in the world. So, Absolutely, yeah. If you're a fan of the show, you'll remember our last episode was about Slapstick, a novel which he said would be the closest thing he would ever write to an autobiography. Yep about how he has to bone his sister to be smart. Right. Uh, and then she dies on Mars because of a Chinese avalanche. I yeah. would argue this is even closer to an autobiography <laughs> being an autobiography. Was that yeah. your takeaway, Alex? It was, yeah. I thought when I picked it up and it says an autobiographical collage on the front of it, I thought Sorry. maybe that's a sign. Bullshit, Mr. Vonnegut. Yeah. Yeah. I was so amazed by it, I couldn't talk anymore. As you can tell, let's talk about how this thing became a thing okay. with a segment that we call Franken Time. It's so live! <sighs> I hadn't imagined it with the chandeliers here, and it's great. This Works. is the best. Yes. Uh, this is a segment about uh, how this book came together, this book, Palm Sunday. Because as Kurt Vonnegut was just being a writer and writing things throughout the 60s and the 50s, there were two professors named Jerome Klinkowitz and John Summer who put all of the things he had ever written that had never been published together for his publisher in 1974. And they were like, you could make this a book. And he was like, I guess. And that became Wampeter's Foam and Grand Falloons, which is a collection of essays and other things by him before. But then that gave him an idea. And he was like, from now on, I am going to personally collect everything I ever write that's never published. We're going to put it together and I'm going to like do all kinds of other writing on top of it. It's going to be this crazy thing. And that's how we got Palm Sunday in yeah. 1981. He calls it connective tissue. I call it, so it's come to this, a Vonnegut clip show. <laughs> um, or copy pasta the book. <laughs> we spoke briefly beforehand. Alex likes the book better than I do. I do. Um, <laughs> but We're opposed in this it's one. It's true. It's great. It, see, you got to include yeah. tension right up front. <laughs> um, yeah, it feels very much, and it is, a collection of great speeches he's given, yeah. uh, great essays he's written, and times he's been asked to speak, just sort of recapping his entire life. He does do a great job of ordering them in an order that makes them meaningful. And yeah, like you yeah. said, providing connective tissue to sort of, this is the one where it's like, if you worship Vonnegut like us and you want to know what was he really like, what did he really think, at least the persona he's willing to present, this is as unguarded as it gets, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And, it really, and it really is a lot of writing beyond just the clip show part. It is a lot of putting together all of these different things into something that's whole and a lot of 
uh, strange origins of the different parts of it, too, that we'll get into as we talk about them. Right. He calls the book Oblivit, uh, which is a word I think he invented <laughs> to describe, like, an assault on all your senses through the written word. Yeah. Um, which I would describe as just a collage of collected materials. Nah, you gotta um, invent yeah. a word, man. <laughs> but That's what others it. do. So, yeah. You're gonna be hearing <laughs> speeches, you're gonna be hearing stories, you're gonna be getting fiction mixed with fact. And yeah. the very first line he writes is, this is a very great book by an American genius. <laughs> so you know it's good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that leads us uh, in a very neat way into another segment we call Story Time. I was not told we would be doing these bits live. Do, 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 I'm do, do, trying do. to improv the best that I can. Do, 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 and you're do, do, just do, do, doing do, these do 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 you piece of crap. Do, 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 do. D's get diplomas. You know, sure, like that was just sure. enough to do the triage. If, you've, uh, if you yeah. very surprisingly have never heard the show before, uh, we jump into segments whenever it feels like the right time. And then there are fun intros for them. And then we do things on top of that. And, and this is episode 15, and I still never know that they're coming. And I'm totally shocked when it comes up yeah. every time. <laughs> That's the fun. And uh, this segment is uh, where we're going to kind of recount how all the different stories in this book and how they come together. There's 19 chapters and then a lot of stuff up front. And we keep finding with these books by Kurt Vonnegut that the initial stuff before it even starts is like some of the most important stuff and best stuff. He doesn't believe in like making you wait to get to the, the fun or the key things. Yeah. Uh, may I ask, because I never, we never get the chance to do this. How many of you have read the book by a show of whatever you want to do? <laughs> Yeah. Like nervous laughter works. Great. How about you guys? And so it's interesting that it's a small minority and yet people still came out. So thank you. I'm yeah. always curious when we're doing the podcast, like if you haven't read the book, do you give a shit at all about this? Right. Yeah. And people tell us they do when they listen without reading it. I don't believe it. them. Yeah. But also maybe they're super fans. You know, yeah. who knows? Uh, so the introduction is very uncharacteristic Vonnegut, especially because it's so interesting to me. I think he just decided to lean into this bit. But he's always self-deprecating. Yeah. But the introduction is basically just a puff piece about how great he is. <laughs> yeah. And like under-recognized in his own time and stuff. Uh, he says, as for Pulitzer Prizes, this book should be eligible for a mega grand slam Pulitzer, right. which would encompass fiction, drama, history, biography, and journalism. <laughs> I'm surprised. There's one part of it that's a musical. I'm surprised he wasn't like, and a Tony. Uh, like, oh, just yeah. Full EGOT. A VGOT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, P-GOT. I like it. Um, and this intro, uh, right before the intro, he dedicates the book to For My Cousins, the De St. Andres Everywhere, Who Has the Castle Now? And he's going to explain later in the book that he has one great-grandparent whose family name was De St. Andre, and it made his mom convinced that those people were nobility, just because it sounds like the De St. Andres would definitely yeah. be <laughs> lords of some kind, you know? And uh, yeah, that, he'll talk about that sort of drove his mother her whole life. She felt that they were of that class and should return to that class yeah. and therefore cared too much about possessions and like worked all her life just to get back to being like high class. Uh, one of the things he will blame her suicide on. Yeah. Welcome to the show. <laughs> um, um, although I like it made me imagine him living in a castle. <laughs> just like it sounds like a diss. Who's got the castle now? <laughs> like, <laughs> Vonnegut alone in a giant study. <laughs> but your thing's probably right. Um, and then the introduction ends with a quote from his ancestor, who we will hear more from later, named Clemens Vonnegut, which yeah. is so interesting because he's so, I mean, Samuel Langhorn Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, is such a spirit animal for him. Yeah. And like the oldest ancestor that he knows of that he talks about in the book is Clemens Vonnegut who said, whoever entertains liberal views and chooses a consort that is captured by superstition risks his liberty and his happiness. And that's what he blames his divorce on. His wife got religious and he yeah. left. <laughs> Which he'll also get to later, maybe not convincingly, but we'll see. We'll find out. And we will decide here once and for all, should Vonnegut have left his <laughs> wife? That's what the people need to know. <laughs> And from there, we get into uh, the chapters of it. The first Absolutely. one is called The First Amendment. And Vonnegut starts it by saying that he feels like he's from the last generation of American novelists because of the way entertainment has worked. He's from the last group of people who could just make a full-time living by doing short story writing and novels like right away. They didn't need to do anything yeah. else. Something I already knew, but very hard to have my face rubbed in. 
Is there, oh, how like, many here would love to make a living writing short stories? Doesn't that sound like the best? Yeah. yeah. It's not a job that exists anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. But God, what a good gig that was. And uh, he even talked in earlier books about how sci-fi tends to be poorly written because they would pay you for your first draft. So, like, why would you go back and back and back? You're just like, people are throwing monies at short stories. You do not right. see that these days. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he also, uh, then the rest of this chapter is him writing letters uh, opposing the censorship of his books and in a lot of cases burning of his books. Right, because including a letter to the school board that actually did publicly burn Slaughterhouse-Five and then all publicly announced that, no, we've never read it. Yeah. We just think it should be burned. <laughs> but yeah, so he sort of bemoans how there can't be writers anymore professionally, yeah. uh, which is very hollow for him to say as a rich writer. <laughs> um, and then moves on to this great letter, as well as like a speech he gave to the ACLU shortly after on the same topic. And then literally a letter he wrote to a Russian writer, Felix Kurznetsov. It's definitely it. There's a lot of accents that indicate that you're supposed <laughs> to slur it out terribly. Kurznetsov, um, who was at that time promoting the censorship of Russian writers. Yeah. And he says he wrote that letter right when he got home from giving the ACLU speech. So it's basically, and I think it's interesting that he puts this first in his autobiography, freedom of speech, all his First Amendment stuff, all his stuff that, for the reasons you assume, Kurt Vonnegut would not want books to be burned. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's also interesting that he leads with that even before the second chapter is called Roots and it's the entire genealogy of his family and it's interesting that he feels that the freedom of people to write and read books is like even more fundamental to the Kurt Vonnegut story, you know, if you want to lay it out as a whole thing. It was like first writing was invented, then I sprang out of someone's head. You know, it's sort of an interesting... Right. Well, and I love from the first part he talks about how People who say, you shouldn't say dumb motherfucker in Slaughterhouse-Five, which is the only curse word in the book, actually. It's called, like, having a Victorian sensibility. And he posits that Queen Victoria actually had this brilliant scheme where she realized if you make words dirty and taboo, people lose the ability to even process those thoughts. Basically the plot of Stargate, if you've seen that film. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he describes a woman who, a German woman, who would like proudly laugh off World War II afterwards and say, well, you know, Germany almost won and like fun stuff like that. And people would say, don't listen to her. She doesn't know politics. Like she's just a silly girl. And he said, and they were right. She did not have the vocabulary to process assholes right. or shit or Auschwitz. That's class. Gray line. Yeah. 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 It limited her worldview. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then the second chapter about Vonnegut's roots, I really love his approach to it because he builds it out of a genealogy that a family friend sent him without him asking for it. It's a guy named Uncle John Roch, and he was, it's more of a quote marks uncle. He was a husband of a first cousin and so on and so on. But he sent Kurt Vonnegut an entire family history of Kurt Vonnegut going back to his great grandparents and a little bit beyond them. And he's also a guy who isn't a fan of Kurt Vonnegut. He doesn't think Kurt Vonnegut's writing is very good. When Cat's Cradle came out, he sent him a postcard saying that, oh, you think life's a load of crap? Read Thackeray. Like, just bothered to write a postcard, go to the mailbox, yeah. be like, your novel's bad, but also sends him an entire genealogy of his life. Yeah, and in fact, that was a recurring theme that shocked me. Even after his like, intense success throughout his life, his entire family basically said, I'm happy that you're wealthy, but I don't get it. I can't read your books. Right. They seem filthy. They seem degenerate. <laughs> they seem like you're just trying, like you're Howard Stern just trying to get a rise out of people. And I don't get that at all. It's insane. I yeah. would call most of his books PG. And he points that out. He's like, I think where it comes from is I'm literally just talking about depths of human grief that it's like untoward to talk about. Yeah, and I think, and it seems like his family matched the local culture in Indianapolis too. He talks in some of his letters about how, right when Slaughterhouse Five was blowing up in the late '60s, at the same time he was against the Vietnam War, and Indiana and Indianapolis was conservative and for it. And so, like, he'd go all across the country doing these sold-out like signings and lectures and stuff, and then go to Indianapolis, and there's a couple people there. It's not a big deal. <laughs> it's his hometown, and it just he didn't it, from his family 
family to the whole town around him except for a few friends it seems like yeah. he just never fit now you can say whatever yeah. you want about Vonnegut's relatives I didn't care <laughs> <laughs> I could skip right through this other than like yeah. I don't know why I care about this I just guess word nerd the origin of the name Vonnegut comes from Vonnegut the yeah. river that they lived on ancestrally that's all I got out of this section. Because the rest is literally like, I have an uncle who does this. And I'm like, Bob, I don't care. Oh. He's like, your fourth great aunt went to the market one day and was arrested and held for four hours. In the oh. Yeah, yeah, I come from hardcore criminals. I thought the arrest would really build, yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I couldn't care less. So chapter three. No, do you want to say well, anything uh, about his family? No, it is, it does go pretty in depth and I think it, it works in, in service of the rest of it. I think also there's a lot there, but I, it's also things I think he's touched on before about how class loomed large in his life and how there was a lot of wealth early in his family. And then as generations went on, it dipped a little bit. And then the great depression hit in a way that sort of bifurcated him and his siblings and his, him from his siblings and his parents. Like his parents were always thinking we are going to be of the wealthiest people in, in town and we have private schools and estates and so on. And then his older siblings were sent to private school, but then he was sent to public school and felt that that was his culture and his people. And so he was even out of place within his family, I think, in a cool way. So, so having the whole genealogy of it, you see like, oh, just German wealth for a century. And then Kurt kind of messes it at the very end. Yeah, I, I will say the one part that really captured my imagination is he calls it the cycle from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. Yeah. Which I don't even know what shirt sleeves are. What are shirt... <laughs> I mean, I feel like I can guess. They're over here, I think. But yeah. does he... I, he just means like not wearing a suit, I guess, but he means from poverty to poverty. And I do think well, that yeah. is a fascinating cycle in America. Like yeah. he, he's able to trace that his family was once the nobility and then crashed and burned again. And it took exactly four generations of people and he knows which assholes lost the money. And like, <laughs> it's, so that's fun to know. Yeah. Like why you aren't anymore. And, and he sort of posits what kind of life he would have had if they had had money, he probably would have stayed and been an architect in his father's firm. And he yeah. says he would have loved that life and probably had more fun than being a writer. Yeah, and his dad specifically warned him off of doing it because his dad was unhappy as a person. His dad was like, it's a terrible way to be, like, just because he was upset. And so Kurt was like, okay, I won't do that stable thing. That's probably fine. And then he, he went on and did, uh, well, well, now we're here, I guess. You know, like, he, <laughs> this happened. Yeah, it did work out, <laughs> yeah. I guess, in the long run. <laughs> and then these next couple chapters, there is a lot more unspooling of family stuff. Yeah. Third chapter is called When I Lost My Innocence. I'm just a lot more excited about oh. this one. Oh, I enjoyed good. When I Lost great, My great. Innocence very much. It yeah. encapsulates a speech he gave for the Cornell Sun, which was the yeah. college newspaper that he worked on. And I think it was the 100th anniversary or yeah. the 10th. <laughs> it, one of those. Yeah. A big round number. <laughs> I forget. And he, he talks about how uh, centered he felt when he put that paper to bed each night because it was a daily paper. And he'd worked on a daily paper in high school, too, which is really unusual and helped spark him wanting to write. So he kind of talks about those college years of his life through that and then also works in an article he wrote for a Swedish paper where they just asked him to talk about when he lost his innocence in general. And he's like, the Hiroshima bomb. And it, like, it's, it, that's his definite True, time. but I really love his attack on it because the angle is when I lost my innocence was when I realized that the hardware store was no longer a safe place. Yeah. He grew up loving tools and loving hardware stores and just had a naive view that like there's no, nothing bad can come from the technology of like creating a tool and using it to assemble something and then when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima he was like <gasps> tools how could you have betrayed me tools like yeah, yeah. especially considering he said that other than the radioactive part that is you know buried deep in the earth you could make a nuke out of roughly all the things you could buy at a hardware store and he just yeah. could never feel the same about going into a hardware store again and I think that's a really cool uh, loss of innocence. Yeah. Talk, and it's talk about PG, come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could have been a lot dicier on that theme. <laughs> and shorter, just yeah. this. And, also, and I think this book is particularly well-structured because toward the end he'll come back to the hardware store being one of the things the family lost. And one of the, like, the Vonnegut's were the hardware business in Indianapolis, and that right. was one of the starts of them having some funds. And then that... There's so many threads in this that I think really tie it's together. It's crazy, including yeah. the point that I guess 
crash bars on the doors that open when you hit the crash bar. Yeah. The most prominent brand is called Vonderpont or something. And the Von <laughs> is for a Vonnegut who like helps oh, invent yeah, it was and like, popularize those crash bars. Yeah, Man, like three guys' names care. put together. And the yeah. Von part was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I care super much about how he's masterfully able to show you how life is a never-ending unspooling of intricate threads of chaos. But every single detail in itself, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Kind of like um, a collage. It works well in that way. The next chapter is called Triage. He talks uh, more about his education and also about being in the army. Also, also dope concept, I think. Yeah, it's an essay that he actually wrote for a paper company whose right. goal, as he says, is to encourage reading of any kind for obvious reasons. Right. So they asked famous authors to just like fill a certain amount of their paper with whatever you want to say, and they handed them out for free. I guess with the thought that there were people who knew how to read but just didn't think it was worth it yet. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. would read and be like, yeah, this is good. I guess I will read. Yeah. Um, Paper is nice. Yeah. They want that at home. Yeah. And, you know, you really want to reel them in with like a big cheerful up story. So he talks about how all of life and everything on earth and all of existence is just the process of losing as little as possible. <laughs> Every choice is triage, which is the act of we have X amount of blood and the, these many people are wounded. Right. Well, these people have less than a 50% chance to live, so just let them die. Yeah. That's triage. And in this essay, he argues that the planet Earth should be called triage, Yeah, uh, which is <laughs> great to me. There's lines we'll pull out later in our favorite section. Yeah. But yeah, that's basically the concept of the essay. And it didn't get a lot of people reading, I hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One person did slit their wrists with the paper, <laughs> but that was really <clears throat> chapter five. And they were, <laughs> and they were fine. They were good. Well, and he also at the very end of it, he does some stuff about just how to write concisely, which feels like a real left turn off of <laughs> the the horrors of life. But and he goes straight from that into a self interview, which he wrote for the Paris Review in 1977. But they they wanted to send somebody to interview him, and he said, No, 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 I'm just going to write a dialogue with a made-up interviewer who's me and then that's how I'll talk about myself to myself and it's great it's so yeah. it is packed with like a lot of the there's so many famous Kurt lines hiding in this thing where he's talking to himself for the French it's amazing it's wonderful yeah yeah and I think he says rightly as he said before like I'm a writer my whole thing is hiding behind the guys of seeming way smarter than I am because I got to write and write and write. And then these assholes keep asking me to talk off the top of my head yeah. like I'm smart and it never <laughs> is good. So he, after a certain point, refused to do interviews other than I will just write an interview and send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> great. It's a great demand to make. He describes writing in that way, I, I think so beautifully, as inflating a Zeppelin with a bike pump. Any idiot can do it. It just takes a very long time. Yeah. He also gets into, there's just some random interesting life stuff. Like apparently when he, he went to the University of Chicago for grad school and when he had his admissions interview, Kurt Vonnegut had famously been in the German city of Dresden when it was firebombed and basically wiped out. And then his admissions interviewer at the university was a guy who had bombed Dresden, who had been in the planes. It's just sort of an awkward like, oh yeah, I remember that. And then, between them, and then they the guy move says, on from it. "Well, we hated to do it." Yeah, and Kurt's like, "Yeah, probably that's true." You yeah. know, uh, and uh, I also love he describes the howitzer that he was trained to fire as so like such a massive, slow, heavy shell that if we had a stepladder, we could have painted "fuck Hitler" on the side of each shell as it came out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to give you an idea of his combat experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I was excited to find out. I don't know why, but it, it really adds an interesting wrinkle to me that he never, he doesn't believe he's ever killed anyone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's I thought weird. you were going to, when you said I was excited to find out, there's a part later in this where he talks about working with Harlan Ellison, and I thought you were going to... Uh, or snuffing out a human life. I think yeah. they're both interesting. Both pretty interesting, that's true. That's yeah, point. the Harlan Ellison <laughs> bit, yes, is, of course, he wrote one of his greatest stories, The Big Space Fuck, mm -hmm. at the request of Harlan Ellison. 
But yeah, I also found it interesting, and he did too, obviously, because he goes into detail now, remember, like asking himself. So he's on the stand asking himself, basically, and you never killed anyone? Well, I don't think so. Did you ever intend to? Well, I fixed my bayonet. I think if everyone charged, I would have, but we didn't charge. Yeah. And it's, it's like, you don't have to go into this if you don't want to. <laughs> You're making yourself. Right, uh, just so that's just fascinating to me, and he even brings up the point, of course, that he shouldn't be alive. The people who think the firebombing of Dresden was an appropriate response also think he and his best friend should be dead because they should have been dead. Yeah, and he yeah. doesn't say they shouldn't firebomb Dresden. He just says, that's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and, he, and there's a few other books where he's kind of come to that thing of, like when he's talking in Wampish Film and Grandpa's about visiting Biafra, the African nation that yes. gets tries to become independent and then loses war for independence, he, at the end of that, just says, let's not blame or be mad at anyone for anything. It's all happened, and we kind of have to accept that it's happened. Yeah. As he will say in this book, I guess, he settled to a lot of his writing students as well. I'm not looking at it, so I'll misquote, but, like, God help you if you try to explain anything, like yeah. why or how something happened. All you can do is observe things and put them down in the book. No one knows why the fuck any of this is happening. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm Kurt Vonnegut, so you don't right. know. <laughs> so it goes, Pooty Wheat, I'm out. I just drop the, yeah. <laughs> Who's got that castle now? <laughs> the next chapter of it is called The People One Knows, and it's a run through a lot of writings by Kurt about various other writers that he's written about. Uh, he talks about William F. Buckley, Joseph Heller, Erwin Shaw, uh, the comedy duo Bob and Ray, and the writer James T. Farrell. Yeah, did, do you know Bob and Ray at all? A little bit, yeah. Does anyone know Bob and Ray? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Old radio show, very funny. Yeah. He quotes three uh, lines. Funnily enough, my favorite line is, there's no shame in being poor, but there may as well be. And yeah. <laughs> he uses that in a novel previously, I think it's Mother Night, and just uses it. And now I come to find out it's literally lifted from a radio show he enjoys. That's odd in retrospect, but great line, nevertheless. Uh, and they said, whoever invented near beer is a poor judge of distance. Classic strong vaudeville jokes. Yeah, just yeah. really solid. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a big collection of writers he loves and things that make him happy. I sort of read it as uh, a treatise on happiness, that bit. Yeah, I can see it, especially because Joseph Hillary talks about Joseph Heller's second book, I think it is, called Something Happened, Something Happened which is yeah. about one man in the suburbs being just horribly let down by a life American that's reasonably beauty. comfortable and Poo -poo fine. American Beauty. Yeah, American yeah. Beauty. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. And yeah, he really seems to tie it all together with that. And he'll also, he keeps going on a run of talking about, of Kurt Vonnegut talking about other writers. The next chapter is called Playmates. He <laughs> focuses on a Statler Brothers song called The Class of 57, which is about thinking about one's old high school graduating class. And he also talks about his own old graduating class. And then uh, from there goes into a dedication for a library. Very interesting aspect of the book. There is not one, but two times where he... I assume he didn't copy and paste, but he transcribed the full lyrics of a Statler Brothers song yeah. into the book unedited. Boy, he loved them a lot. Yeah. I mean, this is going to go forever into like the official canon of Kurt Vonnegut. And there's two parts that are like, hey, have you heard this Garth Brooks song? Here are the lyrics in their entirety. Copyright 1961. I like that song. That's, <laughs> it's an odd choice to me. And he even goes so far in this section as to compare the song Class of 57 favorably to Howl by Allen Ginsberg, which he says is not yes. quite as good. Right. It like, didn't speak to him very much, but this country song did. Yeah. yeah. He also, I love, if you know Howl, you of course know I saw the best minds of my generation. Destroyed by Madness, Starving Hysterical. Good, they might be giant song as well. But he says... I don't know how you can call the best minds of our generation all the writers that died of overdoses. I think it would be the engineers and scientists and stuff. <laughs> and I was like, lay off, Ginsburg. It's a great poem. <laughs> and he rightly says, obviously, it's still a great poem. But he likes this Statler Brothers country song better. And yeah. man, I looked up them singing it live, and it's bell bottoms, 70s suits, the whole bit, oh, horn awesome. mustaches. They're a ridiculous group to go down forever in history. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, I like the idea that this influenced someone who's at some store in the future and is like, okay, I'm here to either buy this country album or Allen Ginsberg country. And 
yeah, Kurt said this one. And like, that's where yeah. they go. Like, they just walk out. Just the one. The he even includes an interlude in one of the chapters about how he and his wife went to see them on tour and really wanted to meet them after, but they didn't yeah. get to. And it's like, why, Kurt? Why? <laughs> right. They're just slides of a vacation. I do love the library speech. Me too. But I'm just going to keep relentlessly bagging on the book now at this point. I think because I know you liked it so much. <laughs> I think this is You're the weirdest. You're here to break me. Well, he I does. See. He tries to connect all the things into like a cohesive autobiography. Yeah. And I love that this one, he ends with this meditation on Howell and his generation of writers. And then he says, speaking of writers, I had a childhood playmate who liked to read. Speaking of reading, here's a speech I gave at a library. <laughs> like, that is not a good segue, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. Especially as we break it down this tightly, I'm realizing there are some left turns that are a little... Yeah. Sharp, yeah. But it's a great speech called The Noodle Factory. Yeah, it's really great. Enjoy. We'll, we'll uh, uh, blur it, I think. All right. Next chapter is called Mark Twain, and it's Kurt Vonnegut talking about Mark Twain, which is like fan fiction I would write if I could, <laughs> but it's here, and it's great. Yeah. Slash fic would be more it's, up my alley. It's, prim- <laughs> it's primarily... Talk about from- a Langhorn. Sorry. <laughs> He's primarily pulling from a speech he gave in 1979 at a dedication of a, res- of a restoration of Mark Twain's old house in Hartford, Connecticut. And he's talking mainly about the power of a few different Twain books, especially Life on the Mississippi and Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Yeah, and his analysis of Connecticut Yankee is so devastating and cool, and I had never yeah. understood it before. Uh, which is basically the end of Army of Darkness, if you know that movie. People from the future transported into medieval times, and there's a battle. And because they were able to cobble together a few machine guns with their knowledge, they win. 54 people against 25,000, they just slaughter them all. Yeah. And when I read that book as a kid, I was just rooting like, yeah, Ash killed the Army of Darkness. <laughs> end of book. It's like uh, Tom Sawyer, what a fun romp. Vonnegut says, really think about that, though. They killed 25,000 people from the past just indiscriminately, and then the book just ends. I think Twain was predicting World War I and World War II, which... If you uh, have listened to another podcast, I never stop plugging Dan Carlin's Hardcore it's History. Great. Yeah. The defining feature of those wars were, for the first time, you had a civilization with advanced technology making f- all-out war with a civilization whose tech... Like, if you played Civilization, <laughs> whose tech tree yeah. is, like, two steps behind. <laughs> and when you have that, you get things like trench warfare and the meat grinder in World War I where just you have untold casualties and life becomes so cheap that you have to have authors like Kurt Vonnegut explain it to you or you'll freak <laughs> out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great take. It's a great it's really depressing cool. take on yeah. uh, King Arthur's Court, I think. When it also, it reminded me that Vonnegut throughout his career, he's saying, oh, people say I'm a science fiction writer, but I'm so much more than that. And I think Mark Twain occasionally wrote science fiction, like Connecticut Yankee, where a guy gets knocked on the head and goes back in time and shoots knights with machine guns. But no one's like, oh, yeah, the great Jules Verne type writer, Mark Twain. It's just like, no, he's mainly this American icon. And then occasionally he got weird. You know, it's a weird thing. Twain got weird from time to time. <laughs> Next chapter is called Funnier on Paper Than Most People. It's mostly a commencement address that Kurt gave at Fredonia College in 1978. And it's a lot of, like, graduation speech kind of stuff, which he did a lot in Wampier's Foam and Grand Falloons uh, and also in life. But I felt like some of it was a rehash to an extent. And it's also such a brag. I do think he's (laughs) one of the funniest authors out there. Yeah. But certainly, like, Douglas Adams is funnier line by line. Uh, And I could name several others. So I didn't like the forwardness of this chapter, Alex. (laughs) It was full of braggadocio that I'm unaccustomed to. That's something I think I learned about, Kurt, is all of his cipher characters that sort of stand in for him in the novels are very, very meek. And in real life, I think he was... at least as he got older, he gave less of a fuck. Like, so he'll say stuff like, I'm funnier than 90% of writers, which he says in this. Yeah, he'll even in life not only be tracking his own reviews, but occasionally write a letter to the guy who wrote him a bad review saying why the guy's wrong and why he's mad at him, <laughs> which takes some, some balls to do, you know, in, even in letter form. And he'll say things like, you know what the funniest joke that can ever possibly be filmed is? Someone walking into a puddle that seems shallow and then they fall completely in. <laughs> that is not true. You get there. <laughs> what about the glass case of emotion scene? <laughs> 
much funnier. What about Mr. Creosote exploding? <laughs> so I just don't like him declaring. He says the funniest joke of all time is why is it why don't cows like giving cream because they don't like squatting over the little bottles? And admittedly, I just did a bad job telling the joke because I don't want you to laugh, but it's not a good joke. Right. I want to imagine like Groucho Marx was in the back of the room and he just walks out angrily like, no, oh, you yeah. jerk. Yeah. <laughs> The next chapter is called Embarrassment. It's pretty brief, and it's mostly Kurt saying that his relatives are embarrassed by his writing, He and more embarrassed by the fact that he got divorced. And then he says he's always felt embarrassed, just as a baseline vibe in life. He has a writer friend who calls it an existential hum, but it's like the tension that exists as a baseline just w- as long as you're alive, it will never go away. Yeah. And he says, for me, I think it's manifest as embarrassment. I have done something wrong. Man. Nothing could resonate with me more. Who else feels that? Great. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like, you know, what we take pills for now. I think that's what he's getting at. <laughs> well, and, and he did towards the end of his life, he, tacitly endorsing it. Yeah, he began to. Yeah, right. And at the very end of it, he talks about a past thing that's in Wampers Film and Grand Balloons, where he uh, got to know a murderer on Cape Cod named Tony Costa. And he just very briefly at the end of this chapter says he like kind of feels a connection to that guy. Anyway, next chapter. Thanks for and like and it's not because of the murder, but it's because of that feeling of like, oh, I feel like I've done wrong a lot, uh, or I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing a lot, and I have no way of knowing how much I've really ever wronged people because I just feel like I've always wronged people all the time. And he says, I await the arrival of the police. <laughs> That's the yeah. <laughs> And then supernatural segue to the next chapter called Religion, which is he, ta- he talks about what gets teased at the beginning, which is that his first wife, Jane's increasing amount of Christianity, uh, he feels that's what pushed the two of them fastest toward divorce and that his ancestor, Clemens Vonnegut, knew it the whole time that that's something that you need to watch out for in a marriage. He then goes from there to Clemens, who was a free thinker, he was an atheist, had written his own Clemens's uh, oration for his funeral just to tell everyone, this is me. I'm dead, everything's fine, you're great, life is fine. And it's a really interesting speech, especially from someone that far back in the past. And it includes a speech then at the end that he gave at a Unitarian church as well. Yeah, which actually, it, I think that had some particularly cool nuggets in it. It's mostly yeah, about seeing the power we'll of dignity in other people. Yeah, yeah. we can, well, let's... Because uh, we got to ramp right into obscenity! <laughs> My kind of chapter. Yeah. So also, in agreeing with you about this having some faults as a book, I think chapter 12 here, obscenity, through chapter 17, I would be interested in a version of this book that didn't, maybe didn't have those chapters. I think you could go from... Is it because he defends the Nazi sympathizer? That's a reason. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> a reason. No, just because especially I think this book has a lot of amazing stuff, particularly about faith and mm. Christianity and Jesus. Okay. And I think it all ties together much more neatly if you don't have the sidebars he's about to go on about cursing and kids and more stuff. Well, I disagree, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. To yeah. make the podcast more interesting. Here we go. But also, actually, I, you would be losing some of my favorite things in the book. Obscenity is where we actually get the full text of the big space fuck, which is an excellent short story. I actually didn't love it. Uh, well, that doesn't yeah. make it not excellent. <laughs> in, to encapsulate it, yeah. it's uh, basically the idea is the earth is ruined. So they basically have a system whereby they decide who's worthy and anyone who's worthy can contribute jism to a yeah. public works project where they're going to take 800 pounds of powdered jism, put it in a rocket ship. Mm-hmm. I can see why you didn't like it, Alex. You're like <laughs> cringing as jism. Is that okay? You have it. I have it. It's fine. If you're listening at home, I have left the room. All right. I'm not here anymore. And they're going to fire it at a Kronos and Classic Infundibulum, which you may recognize from Sirens of Titan, yeah. because those scatter matter to trillions of places at once in the universe. Yeah. And the idea is just... <laughs> if there is such a thing as like a planet where there's a womb that is just yeah. existing, like that's science, folks. That, but that's how it works. Is, they're saying, look, we're shooting jizz everywhere. <laughs> so if there's anywhere in the world where that jizz can find purchase, it shall. And that will save the human race. <laughs> and that's it's the noble, like the human race struggles on in a noble way, I think. Yeah. And then on their way out of Earth, they declare the uh, national mascot to be the lamprey, 
because it's the only animal still left alive on Earth. Right, it's all happening on like a junky Earth where there's too much trash, and like they tried to throw a bunch of trash into the Hawaiian volcanoes and they spit them back out, and like, it's a weird like uh, goofy dystopia, which he does well. And I can just see him like Harlan Ellison asked him to do this. If you don't know, Harlan Ellison totally gets off, really does get off on shocking people, pushing people. He wants you to ban his books and burn his books. And I'm sure that Vonnegut, when he was invited to contribute to an Ellison project, was like, I'll show this motherfucker. Because <laughs> he literally, he says three times in this, I'll have you know I'm the first writer to ever put fuck in the title of a story. <laughs> and I don't know if that's confirmed, but if so, it's quite know. a distinction. It really is. Yeah. John Cleese famously at Graham Chapman's funeral said, I'm the first person to say fuck in a eulogy. Oh, really? I'm fucking sad you're dead, Graham Chapman. Yeah, it was very oh. good. <laughs> They're the best. Let's rip through the, the chapters I'm not as big on. Chapter 13 is called Children. He lists his children. And then uh, there's his speech to the Mental Health Association in 1980. And then uh, there's a few blurs in there. And then the very end of it is a letter by his daughter Nanette to a customer at the restaurant she was waiting tables at who wrote a nasty letter about another waitress. And he briefly dishes on Jack Kerouac becoming like senile and awful at the end of his life, which is interesting to read. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, like yeah. his son Mark almost fist fought Jack Kerouac because Jack Kerouac was just like spouting racist bullshit. Yeah. And because he was just that old and ornery at that point, yeah. Yeah, and this is this book is really full of just other writers of time. So there's a lot to find. Gossip! Uh, speaking of, next chapter is called Jonathan Swift Misperceived. It's a preface that Kurt Vonnegut wrote for Gulliver's Travels that the publisher turned down. They said it was not good and he misunderstood Swift and they weren't going to use it. And so yeah. he put it in his own book. And my favorite thing about it, basically, his perception of Swift is because Swift is a satirist. And I think this is the problem with some satire. He interpreted things as a joke. So, like, Swift basically shone a light on the most disgusting aspects of humanity, yeah. especially from a religious perspective. And Vonnegut says, I choose to believe that that is part of the satire. Swift is showing us that there is nothing human that truly disgusts him. And the publisher's right. If you look at Swift's life and choices and speeches he made, absolutely wrong. He thinks humans are disgusting, sinful, vile. That part was not a joke. Yeah. He was basically just a grumpy old man who hated everyone. <laughs> and so they were like, put it in your so own. Like, yeah, this like, intro, Fine, I will. It's an uplifting twist on it, but it's just not true. <laughs> yeah. The next chapter is called Jekyll and Hyde Updated. And this is someone asked Kurt Vonnegut to write an update of Jekyll and Hyde as a musical theater piece. And Kurt Vonnegut did that, and I, I, re I really don't care for it. I think it has some of the best one-liners, and I'll get to them. Like, yeah. Because he is so great at one-liners. There's so many solid jokes. The plot doesn't really say anything, even right. if you take the time to decode it. And the other weird thing about it, I forget, so let's move on. Cool. It, it ends with instead Jekyll the Hyde as he's a giant chicken and they fight the chicken and uh, they're also all the songs in the script that's what not, it is this is not crazy actually, they're not actually written as songs it's basically just there's a stage direction where it says the flailing of the cast starts to become musical and then a song happens and then everybody kind of settles down and there's more dialogue which is what I like to write and or then he'll, that's he'll, <laughs> that's his musical like <laughs> they sing a song that's very good that someone else will write they perform choreography that someone else will choreograph yeah. It's excellent. <laughs> you cannot write a musical that way. That's cheating. It's not a yeah. musical. It's a play with wishful thinking in the across the page. Right. By a guy who just wants to do bits. That's the whole thing. <laughs> From there, we go straight into a chapter called A Nazi Sympathizer Defended at Some Cost. It's I'm about banging my forehead a, against the microphone. Uh, oh. <laughs> a French writer named Celine. This is a preface that Kurt wrote for a set of his books. The guy, uh, this author wrote a book called Journey to the End of the Night that Vonnegut loved. And then from there, later in his life, he became a rabid anti-Semite and pro-Nazi. And that hurt his reputation uh, as a writer. Good. <laughs> yeah. And Kurt writes about how he feels about the good parts of his work and the unsavory parts of the rest of his life. I still yeah. like Annie Hall, but I'm not going to publish an essay about how great it is. <laughs> it's in poor taste now. Yeah. Well, and, also, and I haven't read that author, so it's not, it doesn't ring sure. for me as a, beyond, a thing beyond his bio. Yeah. And then the next uh, chunk is called A Nazi City Mourned at Some Profit. So you want to gloss over the Nazi stuff, but there's several in a row. He won't right. let you <laughs> get past it. Yeah. 
This this one worked more for me. It's about Dresden, which he famously was in when it was bombed, and that eventually became his novel Slaughterhouse Five. And he talks about how he stopped thinking about Dresden pretty much completely after he got the book Slaughterhouse Five out of his system. And he also says that events involving his wife and his children affected him a lot more than Dresden in the long run. And then he has a preface that they asked him to write for a new version of Slaughterhouse Five. And the whole preface is very short and kind of just says, the war happened to me a long time ago. The book happened to me a long time ago. And they tried to have me talk about it at a screening of a documentary about Dresden. And I left before the talk. I just ran out because I kind of have nothing about it. And I kind of have nothing now. Thanks. And that's his pre- new preface to Slaughterhouse Five, which I think it, it works. Like, it's a working premise, I think. And then I think it ends on him saying he believes, from his calculations, he's made roughly $3 per person killed in Dresden on yeah. his book. Which is just the kind of, like, grim calculus Vonnegut would end on. I really liked that. Yeah, yeah. And he very naturally segues to the next chapter called The Sexual Revolution. Yeah. And this is about a lot more than that. It starts with him talking about how he left his first wife and their home on Cape Cod in 1971. Well, it starts with the lyrics to a Statler Brothers song, but then, And then it gets into that. Yeah, yeah. And then the Statler Brothers song, Flowers on the Wall, which also was famously a Nancy Nancy Sinatra song after that. Uh, But he talks about that and how it's about a guy who feels like he's not of use to anybody anymore or involved in anybody's life anymore. And that he thinks that is the universal conception of heaven. That's what all heavens have in common. It's a place where you're valued simply for having existed. You don't have to prove your utility. And that's why he's pretty sure it's not real. (laughs) It's too good to be true. Yeah, but it is a beautiful distilling of what it is. It's yes. really, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I actually didn't see what it had to do with the sexual revolution at all, but I loved the chapter. And he, he says within the chapter, like, anyway, I better get back to the sexual revolution. He, <laughs> like, says, he, like, he knows wa- he's like, I'm meandering. We've wandered a bit. And there's also some super fascinating, as he wanders, things we'll get into uh, later in later segments, but he grades a bunch of his previous work relative to itself. And then he also shows his graphs of stories. Uh, one thing he tried to submit as a man master's thesis at the University of Chicago was the idea that all story structures can be graphed and you can learn as much about a culture from how those graphs work as you could learn from their pots or arrowheads or or any other physical item like that. The thesis was declined, I think, right? And uh, And his doctoral thesis ended up becoming Cat's Cradle. Yeah, they ended up just looking him up later and saying, hey, we like that book you did and that can count. So now you have a degree. But he, in the book, is still uh, very mad at them and says they can take a flying fuck at the moon, uh, which is a thing he says a lot. Yeah, Yeah. long moon. It shows the story graphs. It's also in that section where we get the origin of the uh, gluing model model airplanes and jerking off anecdote, which is that a friend in high school dared him. The teacher asked what you do for summer vacation, and a friend paid him $5 to say, make model airplanes and jerk off, which was the truth. <laughs> I, don't, I believe he declined the money. Yeah, he, did, he wasn't brave enough. Didn't decline it. stealing the idea. Yes. <laughs> we also have a, a, a Vana friend in the house who brought a model who airplane. brought a model which airplane. Is super fun. His dick yeah. is in his pants, thankfully. <laughs> And uh, from there, the last chapter of the book is called In the Capital of the World. I think he could have also called it Palm Sunday because it's, it touches on that element of the Bible. It's and a he, sermon he gave on Palm Sunday. Yeah, he yeah. talks about his current life in New York and where he feels like he's at because it's you know an autobiography. It's a living person talking about themselves. And then there's a church that lets someone do a guest sermon once a year in New York, at least at that time. And so he does a sermon about Palm Sunday and also the lead up to it and a particular chunk of the Bible where Jesus says something that people have interpreted it as you don't have to worry about the poor all of the time but in actuality he's doing like a really good joke making fun of Judas for being a hypocrite and it's Jesus also- Christ superstar who said Jesus Christ superstar <laughs> right <laughs> the poor matter more than your feet or head it's the ointment part where Mary uh, I'm a little under the weather or I would have nailed yeah, that it would have yeah Mary Magdalene. He's pushing through. This is a flu game kind of show. He's pushing through. It's great. Mary Mag- yeah. well, I was sick when we did Slapstick. I'm sick now. I will be sick every time we do this show, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> but basically, uh, he retells that story where uh, Mary Magdalene gives the ointment to Jesus, and Judas says, what, shouldn't we have spent that on the poor? Jesus says, the poor will always be with us. The classical interpretation of that, which I'll admit was my first hot take on the Bible as well, was... <laughs> Oh, I guess even Jesus thinks you can't, like, I guess until Judgment Day, it can't 
be fixed. Like it'll, there will always be poverty. Right. And Kurt is able to twist that into a much nicer story, yeah. which is, no, nah, he knows he's going to die in a couple of days. He's fucking with Judas. Well, yeah, because he knows that Judas is being like, actually, that would be the nice thing to do. And he knows and Jesus Judas is doesn't like, mean it. Hey, yeah. you betray Jesus. You know, he, so that's, uh, why are you criticizing me? And, it, uh, and he also, I think, really convincingly argues that the humor gets lost because just translations like the King James Bible are pretty ornery, I guess, to read through. Like, it, it, it's hard to also do jokes and bits in but that the point kind of language. Being right. He says yeah. they spoke it in Aramaic and it went through this language and this language hundreds of years. Yeah. If there was such a thing as the subtlety of satire or a joke in any part of the Bible, obviously that's been lost. Yeah. And think about how interesting that is if like 80% of the Bible is satirical. We would never know. <laughs> right. At the time, people were like, Jonah and that whale, best comedy team. Yep. Oh, man. They were the band Just and Eddie. The of, guy oh was God. in the whale. And <laughs> And then he I think very beautifully, I think, wraps up right on that sermon, and then that's that's the show, that's the story. Let's get into a segment called Kurt Blurt. 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 Oh, I, oh, I am the I am a bad co host oh, and a bad friend. Why? I timed that so poorly. Let's well have fun anyway. This is a segment, if you've never heard the show, where we explore favorite sections of the book through particularly choice lines and bits because Kurt Vonnegut is so noted for being uh, so witty and punchy in a short size. And so we're going to do some little Kurt blurts that are our favorites. Yeah, and I'm looking at the clock, and I think we usually try to talk about why the line hit us and what it means to us. I would be down for a speed round if you want to just like yeah read blurts for the good people. That's also if you have heard the show before. It, uh, we're aiming to do a little bit. I'm just gonna take him behind the curtain right now. We're aiming to do a little bit shorter than Kirsten, usual episode. I get it because it's a live show and you want to like stand up at some point and things like that. So like it's a little bit shorter than usual because we're cool. My books so far have argued that most human behavior, no matter how ghastly or ludicrous or glorious or whatever, is innocent. This one, when he's talking, uh, this is from his uh, speech to the Cornell Sun folks. So it's a room full of writers. And he says, this is how you get to be a writer, incidentally. You feel somehow marginal, somehow slightly off balance all the time. God is unknowable, but nature is explaining herself all the time. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> this is part of the triage section. What good is a planet called Earth, after all, if you own no land? Oh, sure, we have another world war coming and another Great Depression, but where are the leaders this time? All you have is a bunch of ordinary people standing around with their thumbs up their ass. <laughs> <laughs> also from the same paragraph, I wouldn't mind being as old as E.B. White if I could actually be E.B. White, which made me realize I wouldn't mind being as old as Kurt Vonnegut if I could be Kurt Vonnegut, and he's dead. <laughs> I also I want to take extra into that thing about we're all we all have our thumbs up our ass. He he a little later in that says that we aren't amazed by our leaders anymore because we see them all the time on television mm -hmm. and we they're just people. And he has a theory that we would be able to be more heartened and amazed by our leaders if they're like they were in the like newsreel days of movies where we only saw them once a week at the theater, interchanged with Humphrey Bogart and Marilyn Monroe and everybody who's a movie star. Are. Like Roosevelt and Churchill feel like, oh, you know, kind of the same thing. Just these glamorous super people. Which is yeah. a FOMA, but possibly a helpful one. De yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. One uh, famous Kurt Lyons in the Paris Review self-interview. Literature should not disappear up its own asshole, so to speak. I have that one. By which he meant, the line right before that really explains what it means. He says, I couldn't play games with my literary ancestors since I'd never studied them systematically. Yeah. His point is, and it, it's, it was a real breakthrough in my understanding of his work, is that's what's unique to his style is he ended up just writing like he spoke because he didn't have a classical education and that voice made him very unique for the time. Like he was not fancy yeah. at all, which right. is a very common way of writing now, but I think less so at the time. Yeah, and in some of his other writing, he'll talk about how like he didn't get to specific amazing pieces of literature until way late in life. Like uh, William Blake is a big one for him. Madame Bovary, uh, yeah. Brothers Karamazov, where he's like, if only I'd seen these before. Like I, these certain ones, that would have been fantastic. In view of the fact that I nearly flunked chemistry, mechanical engineering, and anthropology, and had never taken a course in literature or composition, I was elected to write about literary style. <laughs> I like a very prestigious organization as well. Yeah. Honorary degrees, baby. <laughs> Best way to do it. This is a literary thing, too. 
As for literary criticism in general, I have long felt that any reviewer who expresses rage and loathing for a novel or play or poem is preposterous. He or she is like a person who has put on full armor and attacked a hot fudge sundae or a banana split. (laughs) One of the best lines of his. If you make people laugh or cry about little black marks on sheets of white paper, what is that but a practical joke? (laughs) <laughs> Similarly, carpenters build houses Storytellers use a reader's time in such a way That the reader will not feel their time has been wasted Mechanics fix automobiles I love yeah. that Yeah, not putting it last yeah. This is from his library dedication speech The motto of this noble library is the motto of all meditators Throughout all time Quiet, please <laughs> If I am to say what I believe I must do so without opposition Or I am mute which is about how, like, he can be such a firebrand in his writing, but he's never been able to have an argument with anyone yeah. where he doesn't just go, I'm sorry, whatever you said, agree to disagree. And this really resonated with me. He said, the reason is, the beliefs I have to defend yeah. are so soft and complicated, actually, and when vivisected, turn into bowls of undifferentiated mush. Yeah. And I just think that's such a great encapsulation of how hard it is to argue with someone who's a moron. <laughs> because if you accept nuance, you have more weaknesses than they do if they're like, me believe thing, you know? <laughs> and you're like, but I care. <laughs> yeah. But it's sort of related. Be warned. If you allow yourself to see dignity in someone, you have doomed yourself to wanting to understand and help whoever it is. Not as funny. Yeah, Still not as good. funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people say that my friend Gore Vidal, who once suggested in an interview that I was the worst writer in the United States, is witty, which is a great comedic just sentence structure anyway. But the next sentence is, I myself think he wants an awful lot of credit for wearing a three-piece suit. <laughs> Mike drop. Mike drop. Mike uh, drop. That. Mike. Oh, I like this. We are all experiments in enthusiasms, narrow and preordained. I write. This, because we talked earlier about that speech where sunscreen that you didn't know became a song in the 90s. Yeah, I had no idea. That yeah. Kurt famously was misattributed. But he has a long section in this that really does sound like that speech because he's giving kids yeah. advice and it culminates with, your ears have tiny little bones in them that affect your balance, so just leave your ears completely alone. Don't stick anything in there. They're fine the way they are. (laughs) That's his advice to the graduating men and women, which he immediately follows up with like, and I say that because I have no idea what advice to give you. Life is like impossibly hard. (laughs) But I know if you stab yourself in the ear, that's bad. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I think also that he's his advice. It's like, oh, you you probably want advice on winning love. My advice is smile a lot and learn the lyrics to popular songs. (laughs) Yes. And he says, no respecter of evidence has ever found the least clue as to what life is about and what people should do with it. What do I think young people should do with their lives today? Many things, obviously. I think I, I think I have two more blurts. How, how are you doing on approximate number? Dozen, Baker's dozen. Cool. <laughs> I'm ready to Gatling gun him. It's fine. Yeah, let's go. I'll do one do and then, you, then you, you, you rip. This is from when he's talking about this specific story in the day before Palm Sunday. In the setting, Jesus is having dinner with, among other people, Lazarus. And there's a huge crowd outside to meet Lazarus, not to meet Jesus. And Vonnegut's line is, trust a crowd to look at the wrong end of a miracle every time. It's great. Yeah. I have seen the past and it works. It's about his belief that when our ancestors came to America, we were agreeing, among other things, to do without extended families. It is a painful, inhuman agreement to make. Emotionally, it has been hideously expensive. I agree with that completely. Yeah. Love is a rotten substitute for respect. Here's a line from The Big Space Fuck. Abortions were free. In fact, any woman who volunteered for one got her choice of a bathroom scale or table lamp. <laughs> It's very welcome to the monkey house. It's very, it's like, very Alice You get a cool too, meal. Yeah. Yeah. As I myself have said in other places, I began to have my doubts about truth after it was dropped on Hiroshima. This is great because he's talking to a group of people who are all graduating psychiatrists. And he says, you're going to be telling people, you really can't tell them how to lead their lives, but you're hopefully going to sort of tell them the shape of the roller coaster. It helps sometimes to know the shape of a roller coaster. How many of you have taken Thorazine? That was like his question to the audience. (laughs) There's an across the page in the Jekyll and Hyde thing that I like. Sexually aroused by wealth. That's all. (laughs) Character description. 
<laughs> it's just all bits, the whole thing. That's what you're here at college for, to learn how to look things up. <laughs> Why is it that every time you need a Nobel Prize type idea, you can't think of one? <laughs> a chicken, no matter how large, has no rights in the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> These are all from the play that you were like, rightly so, has no content, but the lines are good. Um, and I'll end with something meaningful. He says of Dresden, it was only temporarily a Nazi city and had for centuries been an art treasure belonging to earthlings everywhere. And I was like, all right, then I'll let you be sad, I guess, about <laughs> Dresden. I'll let you I'll let it slide. And then last yeah. but not least, my favorite thing in the whole book, which is long, bear with me. As for real death, this is about his, how often he has thought about the option of suicide in his life. Yeah. As for real death, don't worry, it's hilarious. It, it really, <laughs> it is. As for real death, it has always been a temptation to me since my mother solved so many problems with it. The child of a suicide will naturally think of death, the big one, as a logical solution to any problem, even one in simple algebra. Question. If farmer A can plant 300 potatoes an hour and farmer B can plant potatoes 50% faster and farmer C can plant potatoes one-third as fast as farmer B and 10,000 potatoes are to be planted per acre, how many nine-hour days will it take the farmers A, B, and C working simultaneously to plant 25 acres? Answer, I think I'll blow my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> That's my last blurt. I love I was, that. I was really hoping someone in the crowd would just hold up like five. Like, yeah, you know, just someone like, knew it instantly without know. trouble. Yeah. One more is uh, he's talking about uh, something that a music critic friend of his said uh, that I'm glad he recorded. Talking about the purpose of artists, he says, The artist says, I can do very little about the chaos around me, but at least I can reduce to perfect order this square of canvas, this piece of paper, this chunk of stone. And then That's he nice. says, Everyone knows that. Which yeah. I like also, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was, uh, I, I love those words. Oh, and I think we can go into a next segment, which is going to be particularly neat in a live setting, called Vana Art. Painting, ah. sculpting, ballet, ah. but not film. Never Water. film. <laughs> <laughs> he does shit on film in this book twice. And, really and other ones, yeah. bothered me. He's appalled by how much it costs. Yeah, that's his problem. Vana Art is a segment where we talk about, especially with these later books as we've gotten into them, whether there's any visual art in the book by Kurt Vonnegut. And this one only has a couple of things, but one really cool bit in particular that we're going to kind of do visually uh, right here in the room. There's one part in Chapter 12 where he does his famous uh, drawing <laughs> it's famous drawing of an asshole yep. and uh, which is interesting because uh, in previous books he's always described it as an asshole in this book we, he finally re reveals it's my asshole <laughs> he says this is a drawing of my yeah. asshole yeah. Kurt cameo <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke for people in other segments yeah. uh, and then uh, he Kurt also grind your pick <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he also does a signature featuring it. And then uh, later in the book, in the chapter about Celine, he does a just drawing of Celine's tombstone. It's, I don't, I'm not entirely clear why, but this is, I don't know, probably the fourth or fifth book we've gotten to just so far where there's a art of a tombstone that Kurt Vonnegut draws. Yeah. It's a, he's, it's a real motif for him. I also didn't get it, so let's move on quickly yeah. before we embarrass ourselves. And then the one other piece of art, which we've graphed out for you, is Kurt Vonnegut's master's thesis. So... He talks about. Uh, I in guess the book. you can see why they didn't accept it. It can fit on a single whiteboard. It seems yeah. like a lazy doctoral thesis. We did draw it very quickly without Russian. It was uh, easy. But this is uh, a. He does a two axis system where there's a uh, y axis, which is going from uh, the top is good situations, the bottom is bad situations, and then the x axis is start of the story to end of the story. And he talks about how one of the most common stories people love in the West is somebody starts in a pretty good situation, everything goes terribly, and then everything gets fixed again. One, two, three, boom. And he also talks about how there, a similar version will be a story where someone finds something good. Oh, things are a little bit good. Great. Oh, they lose the good thing. What's happening? Which teaches What's happening? them that that was the most important thing in their life all along, and they didn't appreciate it enough. Yeah, right. And then by reappreciating it and going on adventures to save it, Everything works out again. They get again. it back forever that? and they'll never lose it. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, yet another part where this book gets very religious in a way that I think is interesting. He talks about how a lot of creation myths and cultures will be just a simple stair step kind of thing. Oh, there was a God. They created more gods than they made a lot of land or sea or birds. Thing, 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 thing. And then everything was created. And then totally there we are. makes sense. Like, wouldn't the first story be the simplest, like... 
this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's yeah. great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. And then we he says, aha, but the Old Testament is a variation on that kind of creation myth because we have step, 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 step. Oh, no, like original sin and floods. And then life is bad from then on. Right. Because of original sin in particular, I think. That's leaving, that's leaving the Garden <laughs> of Eden. Right. And this, this, like, jagged line over here on the right is Catholic guilt for all time. Yeah. yeah. And I think all of us in the room are somewhere on it, like, uh, and everything on earth. That's, so that's the Old Testament. And he draws it. He also very humorously goes out of his way to be like, by the way, I looked into Metamorphosis by Kafka, and the structure is unhappy guy, he's a bug now. That's it. Just yeah. boop, just boop down. That's it. Just a real floppy story. Which is a really story. funny way to go. And then he, in continuing to consider stories, and particularly Western stories, he says, oh, I think I've found out the most fascinating uh, structure of them all, which is Cinderella. Cinderella is an amazing tale because what happens is she starts bad, stair step, stair step, stair step. She gets, you know, a, a she gets a dress, she gets a, a right. carriage, she gets horses, she gets a yeah. shoes. Yeah. There's like a number where animals dress her and so, you know, it keeps going, going, going. And then, oh no, it's midnight and I've lost a slipper and everything's terrible. And then for a while, things are terrible. Things, yeah, yeah. remain terrible. Everybody's even madder at her and her, her kind of step family. And then redemption. Everything works out in the end because uh, she's been a good person this whole time, and so the prince will find her because she's been a good person. And what's really interesting about that, I think, and he points this out, is that it perfectly mimics the story of the Old Testament, but includes the part that we hope will happen where Jesus comes and saves everyone. Yeah, it so, fills in the rest yeah, of the Bible. Yeah, Like Cinderella and every story after that is basically us saying, I know he said he was going to be back soon and it's been 2,000 years, <laughs> but like he's coming back, guys. He said he would. <laughs> and that is a very popular story for our culture. Yeah, yeah. and the University of Chicago was like, nah. No, thanks. Like mildly interesting past. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the Vana art in this book. I think that those graphs are a particularly, especially randomly in a chapter about his like post-divorce uh, it's date. It's called life. the sexual revolution. Well, yeah. And he's like, here's some graphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And from there, let's go into another segment. This one is one we often do about, uh, you know, anything that's maybe a little bit problematic now or then or in general in a segment called Vana What? Vana Who? Vana, Vana Why? What? Vana How? Vana, Vana What? <laughs> We're in sync, I guess. guys. It's I great. Guess. For this, this collection, uh, some books have a lot, some don't. Uh, this one, I had one main one, which is within his Paris Review self-interview, he, his interviewer, who's him, asks him why he doesn't have a lot of uh, female characters in his books. They're like, you don't have a lot of female characters, right? And he's like, you're right, I don't. And they're like, why not? And he says, it's a mechanical problem. And he goes on to explain that if you introduce love into a story, it becomes an overwhelming thing that dominates the whole story, right? And like, he wants his stories to be about a person like going on a, a quest or an adventure or something. So he can't have a lot of female characters because then it would be a love story. And I think that's probably of its time, but very short-sighted, because you can have a female character go on a quest or adventure. You're allowed right, to do exactly, that. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And I believe even some had before Kurt Vonnegut started I'm writing. pretty sure, yeah. yeah. Joan of Arc had been written about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he says, I have no real women, no love, and that's why, and that's just a bullshit answer. It's not true. He yeah, also, the, the Bible even has female characters going on adventures and doing stuff. He lavishes anecdotes on all of his male children. And then at the end of the children's section, he says, I find that I want to protect the privacy of my daughters, so I won't talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure, I guess. And he like says in the roots section, I find that in my family, as I look back, all the stars of the family have been men. That's why there's not much about the women in here. Yeah. And just, we all know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> we can move on. Uh, he, he also says, uh, every man looking at a woman on the street has the same guilty thought about masturbation, and the thought is, please, pretty lady, don't make me play with my private parts again. Which is like, <laughs> that's Aaron Sorkin-level bullshit. <laughs> you don't say that shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I whipped... How could yeah, I not whip myself. it out? She looked at me. Right. <laughs> so that all sucks. Did you have other stuff? 
That was pretty. Yeah, that, that was that was most of it for this one. It's because it's it's very driven by him trying to like impart wisdoms on people, and sure. I, I th- and I think w- with building characters, maybe he runs into more of that often, you know. But just trying to be wisdomful, it becomes harder to be like. And also, I'm wrong about everything, you know. Like, it's yeah. it's a weird. Yeah. Uh, I got a couple. Yeah, yeah. Little real quick. I propose that every person out of work be required to submit a book report before he or she gets his or her welfare check. In context, it yeah. doesn't actually sound like. I don't think he means an that. Alex Jones quote, but out of context, it totally is like Infowars yeah, yeah, yeah. type shit. Well, he, he builds it. He gets into it with like, I, there's so many wonderful writers. I wish there were enough readers for them. And then, and then he, I think, unseriously but taking away that. people's welfare check is not the incentive we need. <laughs> right. He shits on film routinely because he says it stifles the imagination. As an aspiring filmmaker, and I made one, so I guess I'm a you filmmaker. You mean aspiring stifler? Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That bothers me. I understand what he's saying, that a book can open up this kind of imaginary door that a film can't. Yeah. But watch a Lynch film. There's a lot of blanks for you to fill in. Like there are, The film can inspire the imagination as well. And he doesn't know crap about film because he calls it the Texas Chainsaw Murders. He says, like, that's the last movie he saw, and it wasn't good. It wasn't as good as Madame Bovary. I'm over movies. So I didn't like that. I hated The Godmother. Yeah, like, yeah whatever. He's like... It's wrong. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing bits about. And then uh, he actually says this in a nice way. But I really love imagining him saying this as an evil villain tenting their fingers in a lair. <laughs> pure hate beats pure cocaine any day. <laughs> That's like they're brewing up a new street drug called hate to disseminate <laughs> at the rave. That's for 14-year-olds. Right. He and the Joker are gonna put yeah. it in the water. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So as usual, and I always take it kind of as a positive, we become more and more empathetic as time goes on. So even people who are trying to be empathetic sometimes seem like assholes. Yeah. 80 years later. Yeah, yeah. Bound to happen. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we didn't trick you into coming here and we actually hate Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> right, <the> right. <laughs> it's a long... And uh, speaking of, of deep thoughts, let's go into another segment. The segment is called The Meat Tadpoles. Tadpoles is the winner. We all thought he was crazy, but then we had some growing up to do. Only Brett? Brett, did you know what I was referencing? All right. It was a deep thought by Jack Handy. Oh. oh. We're almost out of time, but we got it. <laughs> yeah, we got it. Yeah. Uh, I figure we could do a short meet broadly of like is this an effective short but very way broad meat yeah it's like a what an appetite like a roast it's like one prosciutto slice you're like, yeah. is this an effective way to do an autobiography to like stitch together your own stuff is it lazy instead like is he just like cashing in his old speeches is it both what's going on all right, who are you asking? I'm new to this book. <laughs> oh, no, I've read it. I think it works very, very well, but I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more into the book than you are as far as its quality. Yes, but only because I'm a sucker for... I only care about things that didn't really happen. I, like, <laughs> I want a story that is fictional. Um, it's totally valid. He's an amazing writer. These are amazing insights, and here they are collected for the first time. It's not like he didn't sit down and think of them and write them, and he did all the work of arranging them beautifully. But I preferred the one about the brother and sister having sex so they could be smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah, and it, it but sense. it is, it's, to me, it was almost like reading a great behind, or like watching awesome behind the scenes stuff on a Blu-ray because it really collates all of like the hallmarks of like the Vonnegutian belief set and is so transparent about that. So I liked that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know why people need a teacher to teach them Kurt Vonnegut's works. Kurt Vonnegut's one of the only authors who's like, okay, it's been 10 years since that book came out. So here's an essay where I explain this meant that, this meant that, this yeah. meant that. <laughs> and this is all of that. It's the key to the universe. Yeah. And even, even within individual books, he'll very directly just tell you what the book is about. And like when he gives writing tips, he says, mysteries don't work, which is not true. <laughs> just, but like for him, just the practice of writing a mystery wouldn't make any sense. And this book's yeah. really exciting as a skeleton key of everything. All of his writing and his life and his family, it's all here. I accept I what he said once that he's full of horse shit, which allows you to selectively <laughs> be like, all right, that advice I refute. But right. it's interesting that you think that. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks suspense is bullshit. Yeah. I don't know. Memento yeah. was good. It's pretty good some of the time. <laughs> yeah. And off of that, let's go into another segment called Kurt Vonnegrades. Grades. 
skip, 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 skip. Spoiler alert, Who C passed? minus. <laughs> <laughs> Alex? <laughs> What, we do this segment a lot because in this book, he grades his own work relative to itself. And so the last grade in it is this book. He gra- and he gave the book a C. And uh, Michael gives it a C minus. I give it a B plus. I'm pretty ornery. And I think... No, no, no. Uh, see, you, I was in character. That was just what I was singing for the segment. Oh, I see. C plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've, we've expanded on why. I, I think there's a time. Yeah. But especially, I think if he cut those chapters, uh, what was it, 12 through 17, then it re- it's so much more a book about not only his life, but also being a person who needs faith and doesn't have it and balancing that and also finding a lot that's valuable in Christianity for him. And that's just a fascinating like piece on its own. I think, I think people who don't read Kurt Vonnegut at all would read that on its own for that. Agreed. Yeah. And I always have the caveat that I'm comparing the works of the author against himself. So it's still better than 95% of books I've ever read. Yeah. Because sure. it's a Kurt Vonnegut book. And that's how, and that's how he's comparing himself too. Yeah. Well, great. Let's get into it. We have one more segment before uh, Samvana Friendship, and the segment is called Related Reading. Man, if only there was a thematic symbol of reading around me to help me feel this. This is where we just talk about other books that, and writings that, and other non-books that jump out to us based on the text. Sure. You want to go first or That second? was the sloppiest I've ever introduced. It them. doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, no, I only... they've all tuned out by this point. We're deep into it. <laughs> it's true. I just have two. Uh, one is uh, one he brings up in this called Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. It's another really fascinating format for doing an autobiography because he ties his entire life to the Mississippi River. And also Twain opens it with like the history of colonization from an American perspective. And then also all the way to him being an old famous writer who's thinking back on the river. And it's a, a really cool piece of work and history and you know like a run a pulitzer sort of book i have a book i super don't need to recommend because it was like a huge i believe pulitzer prize winning number one bestseller but yeah the introduction reminded me of nothing so much as a heartbreaking work of staggering genius by dave eggers yeah so if you're just someone out there who's like oh of course i heard of that i heard it was really good but i haven't read it here's another person who's like it's really good <laughs> uh, it's a good one to read Deals cool. a lot with grief and depression in a very wry way. So it has that Vonnegut connection. Oh, cool. Writing style is very different, but the mood is similar. Okay. And yeah. similarly, I braggadocious. Uh, just the title really is what <laughs> yeah. resonated for me. Yeah. He puts it in the even sooner. Right. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, my other one is On Writing by Stephen King, which is That's one good. of the very, very few Stephen King books I've read, and I like it anyway. Because it's, <laughs> it's, uh, like, you would think you would need to have read his other books to read a book about him writing his books, but it works. It's fantastic. And it's, it's a story of his whole life and his near-death experience uh, and, uh, and also just what writing has meant to him becoming a person, which I think Kurt does a lot of in Palm Sunday. It is very brief, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. George Orwell also has a great, very short book on his own writing style. Oh, I cool. think it's called Why I Write, but I could be wrong. But my yeah. next official selection is a Harlan Ellison, because I always pick a Harlan Ellison. I actually have a copy here. It's called The Other Glass Teat. He stole a book. <laughs> he stole a book from the... St- no, he's just kidding. Um, and it's a collection of a column Harlan Ellison wrote on television for many years, all sort of collected together. So it reminded me of Palm Sunday, because it's a collection... It's about TV, I think, in a more even-handed way. He talks about all the shows that he likes and why he likes them, and he unabashedly calls out all these sitcoms that got canceled so long ago you've never heard of them, but he's like, this is bullshit, this is terrible, in very (laughs) fun ways, because he's a great writer. And just because I happen to have it, I had Alex sign it, and I'm going to loft it into the audience and see what happens. (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> and we'll settle that out of court later, <laughs> um, that concussion. If you're listening at home, that was a very large hardcover. Yeah. And um, you should be ashamed. It, yeah, it comes with a glass teat. I think that may have shattered. <laughs> but there's that, a book yeah. I liked and finished so and fun. now hurled at someone's face. Oh, yeah. Coming off of that break into the fourth wall, we're going to go into the last segment of this show called Fauna Friends. There's no... Uh, hey, um, it's the Vaughn I'm being friends. informed by our producer. Uh, we have no second <laughs> intro. And this is an experiment, but uh, uh, we're interested. In, we'll we'll kind of have people raise hands and call on people because we just have these mics. But if anybody has any thoughts on this book or anything else, we'd love to hear about them. And our, our friend with the airplane, please stand. 
Uh, Vonnegut has been a huge influence on my life in general. I'm obviously wearing a shirt and brought a model for Michael, specifically. Yes. But uh, Oh, I get to th- take that home? Yes, this oh, is yours. Oh, thank you. This is yours. A P47 you, and Thunderbolt. They didn't have Tomcats. All right. I, I'd look for them. Better luck next time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You got the gag price. <laughs> nice. I can um, stage my own big space uh, fuck with that. I, yeah. Don't ask me how. So, so this is going to sound messed up in a way I think only Michael would understand that at some point in my life I felt I hadn't suffered enough and I felt like I really needed to experience what true human suffering was in the way that Kurt Vonnegut did so I joined the fucking Marine Corps sorry I don't know if I can curse but (laughs) I think we've made it clear at this point that you can so I joined the Marine Corps I was in the infantry battalion 2011 the same time they caught Bin Laden and I truly suffered in ways I never thought imaginable and even be, be way beyond things I imagined. Part of it was because of Kurt Vonnegut and Catch-22 by Joseph Conrad. I don't regret it for a minute. I feel like the person I've become and the lessons I've learned, I am 10 times happier having experienced what true hell is. <laughs> and, and I mean, as dark as that seems, I feel like you know... You this is the place, man. Vonnegut knows too. I think yeah. the only place where you're wrong is thinking that a lot of people don't understand that. I think a lot I, of people do. I try to remind myself of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, um, the standard canned answer, but thank you for your service, and I'm glad that it brought you to not, a place where you feel more yourself. Thank you. Just the one other note, I don't really have anything to say about the book, but if you guys want to see it afterward, it's in the front. I have a signed hardcover of Slaughterhouse-Five, which is my favorite book. Ooh, wow, nice. Gold leaf and everything. Yeah. If you guys want to check it don't out Don't let that get like, mixed up with the used books. Uh, I, I will, will take it. I will literally murder someone. Yes. <laughs> One thing about the staff here, sticky fingers, I've noticed. What's, uh, what's your name? Danny. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Yeah, one more Woo! time for Danny, please. Thanks very much. Does anybody, anybody else have anything they want? I thought I saw a hand in the back before, but in, in the back there. Where would we take Kurt Vonnegut today, I assume, if he, if he was alive today, crawled out of his yeah. grave... Didn't want to see his children or grandchildren. (laughs) Wanted to hang with us. I will say, I literally, two days ago, just got back from a five-day trip to Detroit, where I had never been. Yeah. And I was blown away how it is both a totem of all that's wrong with American culture and how we're letting people down, but there's also, I was blown away by how much community there is there uh, rising up. So I think I'd take him to Detroit because it really captured like the uneasy balance of that I think Vonnegut appreciated. The world could be nice if everyone just started acting decently. It's not now, but it could be. Yeah. Detroit epitomizes that for me. <laughs> That's really cool. Because also because he, he died, uh, I think, 10 years ago. So he's, he's familiar with a lot of, but that would be really exciting yeah. and new and fresh, I think. Yeah. I, I, would, I think I would take him to Dresden, because I, I, like just wherever it's at now, I think would be interesting, and also uh, I think also like uh, the European Union being what it is would be fascinating to him. I think because I think that's grown a lot the last few years. I'll uh, tell you this: I would avoid any television screen whatsoever. <laughs> if he sees any news, <laughs> we're fucked. Like he's back in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> he can't like you can't even do the classic like it's okay you've been in an accident but you're alive now who's the president well we don't want to tell you that <laughs> it's, it's fine yeah <laughs> just think it's whatever well, year you yeah. think it is I also wanted to ask I think he's, was it Zombiget that was Zombiget. Kurt Zombiget that was funny. what's, what's your name Zombiget. Derek thank you thank Derek. you Derek that's great yeah we got I think we got time for like let's say three more if anybody has anything you're right there Brian asked about, um, we were talking about how prefaces and starts of Vonnegut books can be particularly choice and amazing. And he, sa- he asked if we have any thoughts on the, the preface and intro to Galapagos. And I, that's one I read when I was a teen, and I haven't reread it since. So I don't remember. I've never read it. And <laughs> One unique thing about Vonnegut is his introductions and prefaces can be the best part of the book. And I don't think yeah. I'd say that about any other author. Because in particular, you found with Slapstick, you counted up the preface and then the epilogue were what? Like Like 21%, 22% of the novel. And the preface is the strongest part of it, I think, for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's just good I'm sorry to know I'm not better in the Galapagos, future. Thank yeah. you, Ryan. I'm excited. Yeah. I think we had a hand there. Uh, I want to restate the question. Yeah. 
briefly. Kurt's such a master of satire, and in this book, obviously, like, layers satire even places where it might not have been, like the Judas story, as we discussed. Right. And the question is, what's our take on Harrison Bergeron? Yeah, in particular with Ayn Rand. Which was from Welcome to the Monkey House, I think, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think I said this at the time, and I definitely stand by it, and I think it bears repeating. I don't know, and it really bothers me, too. <laughs> Especially because... Harrison Bergeron is largely about the handicapping system. Yeah. And sort of, which sort of seems to imply a communist ethos, at least in a totalitarian way, of making everyone equal at all costs. You imagine it's satirical and that he doesn't think that's good. But then in Sirens of Titan, the Church of God, the Utterly Indifferent, also uses the handicapping system. Right. And it is an unqualified good thing. In fact, at the beginning of the book, you're explicitly told that thanks to the teachings of that church, there's world peace and everyone on earth has true spiritual contentment. Yeah. So I don't know. And that's one of the things that keeps me up at night. Yeah. And then, like, and then there's the extra, it feels like almost like a, those who walk away from Omelas thing where like uh, the uh, Sirens of Titan world has been improved by this religion, but also they need to torment our main characters throughout the book. Yeah. To like, and, they're, and they're a proof of the religion that makes it work. Where like Harrison Bergeron, I don't think there's anybody who's being put through that kind of ringer in, in, like on their own to make the rest of the world work. It's just everyone's life is terrible. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, it, it is difficult to reconcile those other than to think, I guess Kurt just went different directions, different times. Like, well, also, yeah. right. That's when I on find huge someone, concepts. Yeah. When I find someone who's a font of wisdom, I want to do the lazy thing and think you're my God now. Like everything you say must be right. Right. I have to remind myself, Kurt is also like, is this a good idea? I don't think that anymore. Maybe this. So yeah, there's doubts and there's twists and turns. And I think we're getting like a feel of how his beliefs morphed throughout his whole life. I think anyone thoughtful, their set of beliefs is going to face a lot of challenges and change a lot. Yeah. Most of the people whose beliefs never change end up engaging in acts of great cruelty, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so too. Thank well, you, yeah, I think we have time for uh, <laughs> one more. Let's go in the middle there. Yeah. Sean was asking Great. about the unstuck in time four dimensionality aspect of Slaughterhouse Five. The thing, the fr and if we've experienced that in other works of art, first yeah. thing that comes to mind in recent memory to me is Interstellar. Feels like yes. it kind of took a pass at that. I'm not even endorsing Interstellar necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I was on that theme. Oh, I, yeah, I love that movie. Actually, it's great. Uh, and yeah. I will say, one of my one of my favorite all time things to mess my brain up with is trying to understand special and general relativity. I don't. If you do, and it feels like review, that's amazing. Your brain must be like so interesting, <laughs> um, because I read like relativity for dummies, brief history of time. Like Michael, we swear this time you'll understand relativity, and I just can't wrap my head around it. And uh, I do think Vonnegut had a special insight into, into the fact that everything's bullshit and, even, and time is an illusion. I truly believe that. I think there's a lot of um, Zen appreciation in Vonnegut's work for the transience of all things. And yeah. I can't think that way or function that way. Certainly couldn't plot a story that way. But he can. And that's yeah. why we were so lucky to get those books. Right. And he can interstellar a discussion because he can do it, that scientific thing with so much magic. To not not like casting spells, but it just feels uh, out of the ordinary, even beyond how science does. You know, like I I think of the Ender's Game books, especially a few of the sequels right after it, having a lot of very concrete relativity made it work for them in this way, and that's how it works. And then uh, something like Dune will have, oh, you can navigate the stars, but you need a spice to figure it out. You know, which is like scientific, but not also. And I, I like nobody that I can think of quite does Kurt's mix of making it concrete but also so meaningful yeah it yeah. makes my brain buzz in the same way that like lock stock and two smoking barrels does or the best arrested development episodes it's such like yeah. a finely made swiss watch that i don't understand how it was done and that's the magic <laughs> yeah and i think we're just about out of time and we want to yeah. thank you so much for coming out our thanks also to the last bookstore rebecca and everybody thank on the team for having us and Thank you, thank you. This has been, as we often say, if if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. I thought they would all say it along with us. Yeah, that would have been a That's cooler funny. thing. You're right. Cool. <laughs> thank you guys so much. 